Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the program on constitutional government, and our speaker today is Philip Kennicott. Philip Kennicott is the art and architecture critic of the Washington Post, and in uh, 2013 he won the Pulitzer Prize for criticism. He's um, a graduate of Deep Springs, a small institution, a junior college in the <laughs> east of the Sierras, and in uh, mountainous and deserty California, where my father went, and I have some connections to the Telluride Association, which is um, associated with Deep Springs. But then he went to a uh, um, more usual place, uh, Yale, for to get to get his um, his BA in 1988. He's majored in philosophy and graduated with a summa cum laude. But this wasn't enough to get him to. Uh, Get him, to make him interested in going to graduate school. And so he became a journalist, a writer. He's also a musician. He plays the piano and the harpsichord. And uh, he's um, a, a student of the arts, of the architecture, of architecture and, uh, and music. Writes for the Washington Post and other magazines associated with it. So Philip Kanagati is going to talk about uh, the artist as citizen. I'm going to use the podium. I hope you can hear me with this microphone. Uh, thank you, Harvey. Uh, thank you for the generous invitation to come and for your magnanimity. I discovered in conversations recently with Harvey that um, Harvey's mother had left a piano to this little school that he mentioned that I went to. And I discovered that piano and played it for several years with, with great pleasure and never knew who was the actual uh, contributor of it. And last night I discovered it was actually Harvey's mother who played that, that magnificent instrument. I don't actually write about politics all that often. I write about art. But there are times when art and politics intersect. And in Washington, one of the places where that happens with uh, most productivity is at an institution called the National Portrait Gallery. And in the National Portrait Gallery, um, the place where this happens in the most concentrated way is in the galleries devoted to images of the American presidents. It spans a range from a magnificent Gilbert Stewart uh, portrait of George Washington up to Chuck Close painting uh, Clinton and a black and white photograph of Obama. Um, and when our current president leaves, it will uh, include an image of him as well. If you visit the National Party Gallery, you pass through several rooms and almost 200 years of portraiture until you encounter the first painting that seems decidedly modern. And that's the one that we're looking at here. This is Elaine de Kooning's 1963 painting of John F. Kennedy. Um, she spoke about the process of making it a year after in 1964. And it was clear that she was um, entranced by Kennedy's physical presence. He was not the gray sculptural newspaper image, she recalled a year later. He was incandescent. He was golden. He was bigger than life. And she clearly painted him that way. It's a strikingly vertical portrait. Uh, it is made with these rapid feathery brush strokes with very bold colors pulled across one another, greens over yellows, this curious exposure of the canvas you can see at the bottom of the painting. And this other oddity, you see blues. It was probably painted in, oh, maybe an orange grove or in a beach. It was in Florida that she sat with him for this particular one. But then you also see those blues pulled into things like the shadow of his hairline. Um, the impression left by the portrait makes Kennedy seem a lot less formal um, and certainly a great deal more energetic than any of his predecessors in the gallery. But it also connects the 35th president to trends in contemporary art. And thus, I think it contributes to a durable um, but false impression that's been very carefully cultivated about Kennedy over the years, so carefully cultivated that it's now firmly embedded in popular consciousness. We think of Kennedy as a great esthete. We think of him as an arts lover. And this does not happen to be the case. Kennedy was primarily interested in history. He was a good writer. But those close to him, including his top advisors, said that he was mostly indifferent to music. He was a traditionalist when it came to the visual arts. But he cultivated the image of loving the arts. He invited Robert Frost to recite a poem at his inaugural. He invited Pablo Casals to a very famous dinner in the White House that became one of the kind of classic images of Camelot and glamour. And he also spoke eloquently about the arts, probably more eloquently than any president since. 
The fact that the nation's cultural center is named for Kennedy is one of those strange accidents of history. The authorization, the, uh, the, the law to create the National Culture Center was in fact passed under Eisenhower. And the real work of getting it funded and getting it built was done under Johnson. But after he died, it became the memorial to Kennedy, and so now it's the Kennedy Center, and it bears inscriptions from Kennedy, including one that's become kind of holy writ to beleaguered arts lovers today. I look forward to an America which will not be afraid of grace and beauty. We tend to think of the arts today as spiritually descended from the Kennedy administration, when in fact much of what is now happening was the work of the Johnson administration. It was the Johnson administration that created the National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the American Film Institute that created the Hirshhorn Museum and brought it to Washington, and the Renwick Museum, a museum of American folk art as well. And Kennedy and Johnson, in fact, had very different views and understanding of art and the role of artists in American society. And it's important to understand the difference between them now, especially, because I think the arts world in America is at a significant inflection point. A new paradigm has emerged. And the best way to describe it is that ideas that relate in, in how Kennedy thought about, and sorry, in how Johnson thought about the arts, have in the last 20 years come to fruition and have really quite radically changed the way the arts function in the United States today. If you listen to Kennedy's rhetoric, you hear this curious fusion of a kind of romantic 19th century ideal of the artist as a lonely but prophetic figure with um, Cold War rhetoric about, uh, you know, American preeminence, cultural competition. Um, in a 1962 essay championing the idea of creating a national cultural center, um, Kennedy suggested that the growth of the arts in America was actually a side effect of our technical accomplishment. The growth of the arts, he argued, is part, I think, of a nationwide movement toward excellence, a movement which had its start in the admiration of expertness and skill in our technical society, but which now demands quality in all realms of human life. It was as if somehow if we could put a man on the moon or we're going to put a man on the moon, we should learn how to play the cello. In 1963, when he spoke at Amherst College in honor of Robert Frost, who had died earlier that year, he expanded on that idea of Cold War emulation to address the role of the artist in contemporary society. The artist, he said, however faithful to his personal vision of reality, becomes the last champion of the individual mind and sensibility against an intrusive society and an officious state. The great artist is thus a solitary figure. He has, as Frost said, a lover's quarrel with the world. Compared to that, when Johnson speaks about the arts, it sounds a bit more like he's interested in an infrastructure problem. There were needs of the body, and there were needs of the mind, and the goal of government was to get the resources of art equitably distributed to meet the needs of the mind. In his Great Society speech, he sketched this ideal. He said, it is a place where the city of man serves not only the needs of the body and demands of commerce, but the desire for beauty and the hunger for community. The agencies that he created, including the NEA and the Corporation for Broadcasting, were envisioned in some ways as akin to the <coughs> interstate highway system. They were ways of distributing cultural goods, getting them to as many people as possible. Johnson does word, use words like excellence. He does think on occasion in Kennedy's terms about American civilization, the importance of promoting that in the world. But mainly, he saw art not in the terms of Matthew Arnold. It was not about the best that has been thought and said, but as a generalized impulse to creativity, uh, impulse that was spread throughout the land. At the signing ceremony for the creation of the NEA and the NEH in 1965, he expanded that idea of kind of the locality of the arts. He said, it is in the neighborhoods of each community that a nation's art is born. In countless American towns, there live thousands of obscure and unknown talents. So we have two very distinctly visions of the arts during this period. One sees the artist as solitary, lonely, serving society by standing apart and being critical and being observational, and striving for an excellence that surpasses a generalized sense of creativity. That's Kennedy's model. Johnson's model sees artistry as innate, something in all of us to be discovered and shared, a common property. And the professional artist is, in a sense, a servant within the community. One of his jobs is to bring that innate creativity out of people in the local setting. It's curious that when Congress debates whether or not we should create the NEA and the NEH, it echoes some of these questions, some of this tension. Should the resources, the limited resources available for art, 
be equitably distributed across as far uh, a, a far and wide thing? Should they be given to amateur artists, to folk artists as well? Or should they be concentrated in the cities, in professional arts organizations that would be capable of creating art that would compete with the best that was on view in any of the artistic capitals around the world, including, at that point, Moscow and Leningrad? When he established an advisory council on the arts, this was, a, in a way, a sop to the people who wanted him to do more for the arts. Kennedy um, warned against diminishing the importance of professionalism in the arts. He said that the rich range of amateur activities which abound in our country should not be seen as a substitute for real professional. By contrast, Johnson embraces a far more diverse sense of the arts. So despite the glamour of Kennedy's rhetoric, it really is Johnson's view of the arts that has come down to us today, and particularly in an idea that gives the, uh, the title to this talk, The Artist as Citizen. I'm very sorry if some of you came hoping that the artist as citizen was going to be about the long history of the way artists relate to the state. Um, I won't be speaking so much about Plato or Rousseau or Kant today, but rather about an idea that has great currency in contemporary artistic culture, in contemporary arts administration. It's an idea that's been championed far and wide in this country. The preeminent cellist Yo-Yo Ma has used his formidable reputation to encourage a new generation of citizen artists, as he calls them. It's the title of a book by the recently retired president of the Juilliard School, um, who radically reshaped professional arts training there and wrote about the artist as citizen as really his model for how artists should emerge from the nation's most important conservatory. It was the theme of a recent art summit that hosted by the Kennedy Center, which has also launched what it calls a Citizen Artist Fellowship to recognize artists across the country who utilize their art form for positive impact on communities from large to small. It's also the main theme of the Aspen Institute's arts program. Um, and it is also behind the Citizen Artist Incubator, which is an international uh, artist idea that's funded primarily by the European Union. So this is really the dominant idea of how the art should be functioning, um, not just in America, but, but widely, and, and it's being spread. What does it mean, the artist as citizen? I mean, certainly artists are already citizens. They must be citizens. Fundamentally, it's really about changing the nature of what artists do away from necessarily making artists their exclusive occupation to serving as a social service agent, educator, community builder. A popular word is ambassador. But it also encompasses a range of other ideas, and I'm going to kind of lump them together because socially, if you are with somebody who's talking about the artist as citizen, you will hear these same ancillary ideas as well. Um, in many ways, it's a reaction to the perceived elitism of the established arts organizations, the ones that were really in the best position to thrive under the old model back when the NEA was funding them, and also particularly the Ford Foundation. This is going back to the 1950s. Um, these organizations are really now perceived as being aloof, being removed from the community, um, not really uh, deserving the uh, amount of public funding they're getting. So it's an argument with those established institutions, um, a way of getting outside the box of the established cultural centers. But the idea, this artist as citizen, also incorporates themes and ideas that are popular in the tech sector and uh, among people who study organizational culture. So, for instance, it celebrates collaboration, not really as an end to artistic uh, production, but as an end in itself. Col collaboration really as a, a good thing, regardless of what results from collaboration. It also conveys a distaste for um, conventional ideas about the artistic canon, or dividing lines or silos between artistic disciplines, and certainly an aversion to hierarchies within the arts, and any firm dividing line between the arts and entertainment. Among the most recent uh, of these associated ideas with the art as a citizen is something called creative placemaking. This was a coinage of the National Endowment for the Arts under the Obama administration that attempts to get artists connected with local economic or community development projects and very much sort of localizes the impact um, and the operation of the artists within communities. A number of Johnson's best ideas about the arts come to fruition in the art as a citizen especially the idea of access for the arts and the notion that the arts should be for everyone. That, I think, is axiomatic. But there was a shift in emphasis, an important shift from Kennedy's ideas about excellence to Johnson's ideas about creativity. In 1997, there was a meeting of a, an organization called the American Assembly. This is a kind of think tank that was founded under Eisenhower when he was uh, president of Columbia University. 
And they summoned top arts leaders to think about a new paradigm for the arts. This is now 20 years ago. And the work that came out of that American Assembly meeting really established this new sense of the arts, this new paradigm. They published a book called The Public Life of Arts in the America as a kind of summation of the conversations that they had. And this is how that book describes this new paradigm. The core value of artistic excellence, originally a guiding principle for public subsidies, seems to be transforming into a focus on creativity. Artistic excellence was associated with elitism and tended to focus attention on artistic products. Creativity, however, can more easily accommodate cultural pluralism and tends to focus attention on artistic process. So products versus process. The American Assembly meeting in 1997 really was a kind of watershed for the arts in America. And it's not one that I think is widely known, nor particularly understood by people who consider themselves engaged with the arts. The participants at the time were responding to a number of practical things. It was 1997. They were trying to deal with the fallout of the, of the culture wars, the debates about the funding of arts and obscenity and the artist proper freedom when they're being given public funds that had happened through the early 90s. So the word artist had taken on a sort of bad odor, and there was an attempt to try and reinvent the artist in a new way that would not be associated with some of those, some of those issues. There was also an emerging economic imperative at the time. There had been throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s enormous growth in the arts in America. Symphony orchestras, which had been primarily in major cities, were cropping up in smaller cities, in small towns all across the country. Theater companies, opera companies, museums. Many people perceived essentially an overcapacity in the arts. And as they watched audiences get older, as they watched them um, move to other forms of entertainment, as they watched entertainment become something much more that you did in your house with videotapes, the question was, what do we do with this overcapacity? So it made a certain sense to repurpose particularly the performing arts as doing things besides simply giving concerts um, 52 weeks of the year. Um, if you could take people away from the concerts and not have uh, half sold out halls and have them working as educators, working in the communities, that was a useful way to fulfill your obligation, which often was a union contract employing these musicians at a relatively good salary for the entire year. So it's no surprise that even today, if you look at Help Wanted ads in the performing arts, you'll see things, for instance, assistant conductor and community ambassador. It was a way, in a sense, of diversifying what the musicians did. <laughs> This paradigm, I think, is not you know, absolutely new to our current moment. Um, there are echoes of it. And I would trace those echoes back to that point in American history where American artists are first emerging with sufficient skill that they can actually compete with artists in Europe. So this is going back to about the 1820s and 1830s. And um, foremost among these, of course, are the writers, the transcendentalists. And they have a very particular view that in ways echoes where we have gotten with the Johnson view of the arts. Emerson says a lot of very inspiring and maddeningly contradictory things about the arts, but I think he definitely sees the artist as a servant and certainly as selfless in some way. He says the artist is not to speak his own words or do his own works or think his own thoughts, but he is to be an organ through which the universal mind acts. The transcendentalists generally believed that the artist um, was transformed, that art transforms the artist, and that was the fundamental thing that was important. So that Thoreau can write, that it is not the idea how it is expressed in stone or canvas, but how far it has obtained form and expression in the life of the artist. And I think they also felt that the process of making art was more important than the actual art itself, which does echo Johnson's sense in a way. The historian Neil Harris has summed this up, I think, very well. He writes, <coughs> The transcendentalists most valued art energy, not art achievement, the artist's life rather than the artist's works. Not all of them were prepared to appreciate, study, or even experience great art, but all saw the artist's role in society as meaningful and inspirational. So we might say that there is a long-standing American tradition that values both artistic service and creativity, but in a way distinctly different from where we are now. The Transcendentalists valued service to something universal as a means of transforming our lives and our communities. And they stressed creativity not at the expense of excellence, but as a kind of homage to an unachievable perfection in the arts. The paradigm change suggested by the American Assembly two decades ago is, is now complete. And I think there's a disturbing degree of uniformity and even dogma in the professional arts world today. 
We see things like the basic metaphors for talking about how and where art is made change. <coughs> the artist doesn't make art in the lonely, drafty garret anymore. The artist makes art in the kitchen. Or as one current arts advocate puts it, the places in which people make culture might be thought of as cultural kitchens, where people sort out thought issues and create the identities and forms of representation that they share with each other and offer the rest of the world. It's a cumulative activity of making a meal and sharing a meal together. Advocates for the idea of the artist as citizen are vehement that there is no contradiction, no tension between excellence and the idea of public service. And they are right. It is not necessarily the case that if an artist uh, performs public service, that the quality of their work is going down. But it's curious how the word excellence disappears from the discourse. You don't hear it in most places that people talk about arts. It's a bit of an embarrassment. A mission statement for the 2017 <coughs> Kennedy Center Art Summit described the purpose of the Kennedy Center. It says, we honor President John F. Kennedy's legacy through ideals of courage, service, justice, freedom, and gratitude. There's a curious word missing in there, and it's a word that mattered to Kennedy greatly, and that's the word excellence. Kennedy's insistence on excellence is not the only thing that goes silent in this new paradigm. There isn't really much interest in, um, in landscape, in nature. Um, sometimes landscape will sneak in through the back door through the, the question of environmental art, but the notion of an individual encounter with the landscape is not really a subject of much of what's happening in the art world today. I think artists who by temperament are not particularly extrovert, who are not necessarily good at public speaking, who are not entrepreneurial, are handicapped within this new model of the artist as a citizen. In fact, many people have now uh, taken to talking about artist producers rather than merely artists. Frost's notion of a lover's quarrel with the world, well, that sounds rather quaint today, especially if your role is to be an ambassador within the community. Ambassadors, of course, are not supposed to argue. The idea that the arts help us deal with intensely personal things, things like the fear of death, grief, failure, solitude, emotional isolation, all of this is a little bit embarrassing when people talk about the arts within this artist as citizen model. And fundamentally, there isn't really much conversation about what artists actually do and how art operates in the community or in the society. It's sort of embarrassment, embarrassing to think about the arts and the role of the artist. As one arts advocate wrote in a book published just two years ago, what the cultural policy sector has not delivered <clears throat> in its paradigm shifting work of the last 17 years is a clear description of the term artist. I think that's fairly remarkable. Certainly, the arts have always had a parallel discourse about what artists do and how they function and, and what it is that we encounter when we, uh, when we see and engage with a work of art. There's not much discussion about that phenomenological aspect of the arts anymore. But what I miss most, I think, in the current discourse is any conversation about loneliness, <coughs> about the importance of solitude, about ideas like silence and reflection. So I think if you want the arts to serve a purpose in society, you have to stress these things. You have to stress the way in which the struggle to understand our own isolated and particular condition is, um, precedes and determines our efforts to understand the general and communal condition. I may be unfair to criticize people who are in the business of arts administration and arts policy for not being sufficiently poetic or humanistic about the way they talk about arts. But policy is not unrelated to the kinds of questions that we ask. It's not unrelated to the kinds of people who will thrive under a given policy. It's not unrelated to those who will benefit from policy. In the same book that Kennedy wrote his essay on the arts in America, this was a book championing the creation of this National Cultural Center that eventually became the Kennedy Center. James Baldwin also wrote an essay. One wouldn't necessarily think of Kennedy and Baldwin and necessarily as, as having as much in common as they do, but as you compare what they wrote for this book, there is a striking commonality. And I'm going to end with what Baldwin wrote, because he says it far better than I possibly can. The artist, Baldwin said, must actively cultivate that state which most men avoid, the state of being alone. That all men are alone is a banality, a banality because it is very frequently stated, but very rarely on the evidence believed. Most of us are not compelled to linger with the knowledge of our aloneness, for a knowledge of that can paralyze action in the world. There are swamps to be drained, cities to be created, mines to be exploited, children to be fed. None of these things can be done alone. But the conquest of the physical world is not man's only duty. He is enjoined to conquer the great wilderness of himself 
The precise role of the artist, then, is to eliminate that darkness, to blaze roads through that vast forest, so that we will not, in all our doing, lose sight of its purpose, which is, after all, to make the world a more human dwelling place. Thanks for your indulgence. Sure. Go. Thank you. A very fascinating uh, talk. I'm wondering uh, if we can't, if it's if it's possible to talk about art as citizen without talking about art uh, within the Cold War context and as a means of, I guess, to borrow Bordeaux's term, cultural capital. In essence, to propagate uh, the West and NATO's cultural um, um, excellence in contradistinction to um, the, the, the Russian use of art, which was, and as you know as a pianist, uh, certainly if we can go think of great piano players, how many names can you think of that start with Vladimir or some other Russian name? Clearly, when you talk about the new Soviet man, when you talk about the building of the Russian utopian person as a citizen, as an Eastern citizen, it is intertwined with propaganda. Art is propaganda, the cultural propagation there. And when I see this painting, I'm thinking, what is this going, stating against? Wow, that is not realist. This is not a Soviet realist. This is a state, this is like a big middle finger to, pardon the expression, but a big middle finger to Soviet realism. And I'm wondering if we're conflating an individual's interest with his role as a politician, which is to represent the cultural capital of, of the West. So it's not about the citizen, it is about Western cultural imperialism. That goes all the way to diplomacy. If you look at in contrast, the architecture of foreign embassies. We didn't have these austere mausoleums um, that really represented um, conformity. We had independence and expression. That is high art, both great, excellent, but also distinctively American. Well, let me, let me back up a little bit at the, the beginning of your question. Um, it is interesting that the artist and citizen model definitely defines citizen very locally. Um, it's a citizen of a community. It's not necessarily a citizen of the country. Um, because to do that would mean you had to have a, a stronger sense of what American art is. You'd have to have a stronger sense, maybe uh, when you use Bourdieu's notion of cultural capital, of, of American cultural capital. Um, when you look at, the, at Russia today, um, they are still producing arts in a fairly conservative model of uh, fairly close in, in many ways to what they were doing on, under the Cold War. Um, the conservatories are strong. The the opera companies, the symphonies are still well funded and well attended. Um, there isn't quite the same um, embarrassment about whether or not these are elite institutions. They're seen very much as Russian or national institutions. It's obviously much more difficult for the United States as a as a multicultural and a pluralistic society to do that. But I do think that we've lost a lot of momentum, um, especially since 2001, by not having, um, in a sense, a, a more forthright cultural policy in, in the world. Um, you know, it, it, we've pulled out of things like the USIA, and we've, we've, we've removed ourselves from a lot of the, the, the major cultural organizations. Um, you don't hear of these things, you know, these Cold War activities like sending abstract paintings around the world or sending American jazz artists. This, this is all seems like it belonged to a different era. I think there's a lot of value to be had from doing that, especially, you know, at, at a moment when we find ourselves, um, you know, in, in multiple crises around the world. Part of the problem is that I, I think that the arts have become so marginal in the United States that it's difficult for politicians to even countenance the idea that they could be effective in that, that role. We're so far from that period that we don't even really remember it in a practical way. I don't know if I answered your question. You, you, um, I, I'm wondering if we, if we forgot the per I'm wondering if there's a difference between what, uh, let's see what I wrote, what people actually say you talked about what, what these politicians will say. 
and what they really mean. And I wonder, or, and what the original intent, and I wonder if this is actually, I would surmise that this is a political project that we of, of funded by the states through places like Colombia, where, where we are essentially trying to, to analogously, we had, we had a space race, didn't we also have some sort of artistic <coughs> race against the Cold War? And with the, you know, with the end of history, we also had the end of art history, and we, as a as a as a polity, we did we we underestimated the role of art actually as something that binds um, the West in a way, in contradistinction to to I think what is actually very successful in Russia, which is quite obviously they're going back to and sure they're reading the old stuff and regurgitating it, but it works and. And Putin is certainly all things to all people. He's, a, he's, he's superhuman. We can make fun of the fact that his shirt is off, but it works there. It works in other, uh, in the post-Soviet space. You look at um, North Korea, right? We have the Palace of the Arts. Clearly, something that binds them and creates the imagined community. And I think maybe we underestimated that. I I think we underestimated the amount of energy it takes to create and, and keep together um, culture. It, 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 in many ways, is, is falling apart through a lack of care, a lack of tending, I think, in, in the United States. I wouldn't want to romanticize, whoever, any sort of Soviet notion or, or, or authoritarian notion of culture, because I don't think that's, that's where we want to be. Um, you know, we want when we were sending the abstract expressionists around the world, we were, we were definitely promoting um, a sense of democratic ideal through that, a sense of you know, personal freedom among the artists, even if this was not necessarily funded by um, people who were in that particular game. Um, I think what's happening mainly is that a number of institutions have found a way to repurpose uh, forces and funds to their own ends. There was a sort of disarray in cultural policy after the culture, the culture wars in the 90s. And people stepped into the breach and figured out a new way to keep those resources circulating, but keep them circulating um, to their own ends. Um, and it turned out that that was a very localized, very um, sort of dispersive notion of culture. Yes. Um, very interesting. Uh, talk. Um, I'm wondering, it, it seems to me as I was listening to you, and then I was also thinking about what contemporary artists are doing, that there seemed to be some diversion between these ideals that art institutions and, and curators of art institutions are propagating and what artists are doing. Because if you have plowed through a postmodernist novel or poetry or gone to a contemporary art museum or listened to a contemporary music, what, what strikes you is that it's basically inaccessible to perhaps to everyone except perhaps the creator and perhaps and a, and a small <coughs> circle. And it seems to me that's what, what artists are doing and I find it difficult to, so in some respects, they're in that isolation that, that you referred to with with Frost, except that they're they've gone, I think, several degrees uh, beyond that. How do they all? How does it fit in what they are doing with this with this uh, objective of the uh, you know, uh, the promoters of the institutions? You know, I, th I think that there's a there's a kind of complex academic form of the arts that is now pretty much on the run in most places. Um, this is, if you looked at uh, music and composition departments throughout the 60s and 70s, uh, it was dominated by composers making a, a music that was, was not really very accessible, certainly not to ordinary listeners. You had to have a, a great deal of, of training and a good deal of patience to, uh, to try and find the meaning in these works. There is a, a kind of art that's happening in the more sophisticated galleries in, in New York and in some of the the more sophisticated contemporary art museums, it's also not accessible. But what's also happening is there's a essentially creation of a, a whole new kind of art that is primarily um, based on the notion of accessibility. Um, and this is happening, this is what is happening at the, at the local level. This is what you'll see when you look at something like creative placemaking. 
um, creative placemaking is not going to be, you know, an atonal opera um, in, in a factory. It's going to be um, using local musicians who are making music that's of interest to the people um, in the immediate community in a local space. So, in a sense, you're, you're having a division of these worlds, and I suspect that the that old, the older academic model that was often quite complicated and obscurantist, that's fading. And in a way, people are almost getting nostalgic for it at this point, um, because it's, it's, at some point it's going to be gone, and it'll be a, a bittersweet memory um, for people who found it frustrating. Yes, Robert. Um, so it, yeah, it's, I think a fascinating talk. Um, and I, I guess I'm just wondering, is your, so there, there's a worry obviously that you have about uh, this new discourse surrounding the artist as a citizen. But I was, I guess I, my question is just, is the worry primarily about the decline of the artist as a kind of critical lonely voice challenging authoritative opinion? Or is it rather, um, about the decline of the artist as a specimen of human excellence, as a kind of embodiment of the best that has been said and thought. I'm primarily concerned about a range of things that are not being talked about. I, I would consider myself as a preservationist, in a sense, okay. that there are there were a number of ways that we used to talk about art that we're no longer talking about it. And as those disappear, I wonder what happens to the artists who don't fit into the models that exist. So it can be both things. It can be, um, you know, an artist who simply by temperament is cussed and doesn't fit into a community center, who doesn't interact well with the audience, but does brilliant work, does excellent work. Um, the loss of emphasis on excellence is, is part of a broader change. Um, you know, if you, if you think, for example, of a, of a contemporary museum, they have a tension between wanting to get lots of people through the front door and wanting to fill their, their academic and their curatorial mission. And in a sense, it becomes uh, a question about how much, you know, where's the balance between those things? And my concern, is essentially as a preservationist, is that those functions are often these, you know, the academic, the curatorial, um, the advancing the discourse about a particular painter, that that's getting, um, that's getting slighted. And most of the forces in place are going to con continue to sort of swing the balance towards the idea of access. So that you end up having shows that are not very good, but get lots and lots of people through the front door. And that then becomes the metric by which the museum says they're succeeding. And, and if you want to sort of see where any particular institution falls on this scale, just look at how they talk about their parameters for success. Do they say, you know, 250,000 people visited, or do they say this exhibition changed the understanding of X or Y or Z? And my concern is there's not enough of that yeah. and too much of, of simply the, the volumes of people. Dimitri, also from Yale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for the talk. I, I very much enjoyed it. I was wondering about the, the thing you said right at the end about one of the things that's being lost is art is no longer provoking people to encounter solitude in a particular kind of way. And there was another transition that you described on which art increasingly becomes about the act of the artist creating the art rather than the piece of art that is created at the end. And I wonder how those relate to one another because it seems to me that the transition in focus away from art as a work for the public and towards this intense exercise or activity of art creation, it does reflect a different kind of focus on the solitude of art. In a sense, the artist is saying, by making art, art is an exercise in grappling with my own solitude. It's a solitary uh, human experience. And that's why it's not about interacting with the public in some way. And so in sort of this odd way, it seems that when art becomes this increasingly solitude solitary exercise for the artist, it also ceases to help or to, to confront broader audiences or to help all broader audiences confront that set of, of questions and human concerns. So I'm wondering how those two relate. You know, I, I think the transcendentalists are not the only ones to believe that the, the process of internal form or self-reform or self-reflection becomes, has impacts in the world that it, it precedes 
um, making changes in the world. It's, it's necessary for that kind of solitary reflection before one can be out in the world. And oftentimes that's seen as kind of a cop-out, you know, especially if, if you believe art should be urgently at work in the world. You know, why are you focusing on this solipsistic idea of the artist grappling with himself, grappling with these internal changes? Um, but I don't think that's really true. And I think we're actually at a moment in our culture where it's particularly not true. If you look at the way we're relating to contemporary media, to social media in particular, um, we actually need to discipline ourselves. That there's a lot of collective action that comes from, in a sense, individual decadence in relationship to these kind of media. So that the process of, of looking at how you relate to something very personally um, is a way of actually improving the, the potential collective chance of being better at something. So that if individually you sit down and you get really angry at X, Y, and Z um, in a way that, that, that corrupts your ability to actually be an agent in the world, you need to be focusing on that. And I think, in fact, that we're at a moment in our country where um, the notion of looking inward at, at your own character is absolutely essential. Um, it's not always the case. I mean, there will be times when the urgency of collective action means you have to skip that step. But I think that becomes, a, at this moment, we're at that, that crisis point. Oh, that was very interesting. Uh, description of how sort of policy shifts right, have changed our experience of art, which art is really promoted. But I guess I'm wondering if the crisis isn't more profound and um, internal to art itself, in a way. I, I'll give a couple of examples to think maybe that might be the case. Um, there's a period uh, when I was a grad student trying to make money overseas, adjuncting at art schools at Beaux Arts in Paris and Pensalel in Israel. And one of the things that really struck me about this is a student wouldn't say to you, I'm a painter or a sculptor. Um, they'd always say, I'm an artist. You know, the grandmother would ask them what they do, say, I'm an artist. That's a fundamental distinction of artist and non-artist, and not the particular craft they did. And this was often connected to the fact that their medium wasn't specific to a craft or a place or something particular, but you know, it was bound up with video. <laughs> Um, so that the distinction in a way between artist and non-artist was effaced by what they could do with the you know, um, way they, yeah. So everything became part of their art, so that just them living their lives, documenting art in various forms, was well, their art, right? they really one. And, and, and it struck me that this is related to shifts that occurred within art history within the 20th century. You, you think of Duchamp on the one hand, Warhol on the other, the ready-made and pop art, both of which, it seemed to me, um, you know, shift what we thought was the relationship between an art object and a non art non art object in opposite directions, you might say, introducing a kind of crisis in the work of art. Um, and I think part of that crisis was what you were referring to, the kind of retreat necesotericism, higher forms of uh, community building around being a part of the understanding of conception of that crisis. But I, I guess now I'm meandering. As a question, could the crisis be bound up with uh, movements in Western art altogether about the status of the work of art and the breakdown of the distinction between art and non-art, such that now we can say everything is art in a way that I think you're detecting and I'm sympathetic with nothing is art. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I think you're absolutely right that they, that, that they are related. I don't think we'd be at the point we are now if there hadn't been those changes that you've uh, identified. Um, you, you know, when you, when you look at the, the the value, the positive value of working across artistic disciplines, I mean, that, that's kind of axiomatic in, in art schools today. And there, there's, there is a lot of value to it. I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff that has come. There's a lot of art that, that simply would not have existed. Um, but it becomes very difficult for, I think, the artists who are not interested in working across those disciplines, um, the artists who do, in fact, define themselves simply as, as a painter, um, as a sculptor, uh, you know, what role do they put in? The, the challenge is to say, okay, here, is, here are a set of options you have. You can, you can break down these silos. You can make art across these things. You don't have to be hemmed in by traditional notions of, of painting or sculpture or any of these other things. 
but nor do you have to take advantage of all of those options if you don't want to. If what you need to do is, in fact, happily within a <coughs> silo, um, then work within your silo. That's the thing that I, I worry that we're missing. It's that permission, in a sense, to work um, within a fairly old-fashioned way within the arts, along with allowing the arts to go in the directions that they're, they're, they're going to go. When I said in the speech that you know there's not much talk about what the artist actually does, well, that relates exactly to what you're saying, because as soon as you begin to talk about what the artist does or what art <coughs> is, you get precisely to those, those, those questions, the breakdown. I mean, one of the reasons that we can't define art is that to do so, in, in a sense, is, is to violate somebody's rules about it. Um, we don't have things like a Royal Academy. Um, you know, we don't have any sort of traditional curriculum that establishes what the arts are supposed to, or should be. I think, I think that is a positive aspect of the way the arts function in America. The, the, the residue of that is that we get to the point where it's very difficult to have a conversation at all about what the arts are or should be. Um. I have some follow-up questions <clears throat> on, at, uh, on the previous ones here, amazing. And, um, the, um, when, is, when can we identify by name the last big period in American art. Like Nathan mentioned abstract expressionism when he did. I'm not educated enough to know of anything past that that one could give a name for uh, to uh, in American art. And is it true um, what Nathan said that or is was this the last movement that was supported financially also by U.S. politics. I've heard that even the CIA was involved in making these guys big and in making it a, an American thing to be exported and to show American freedom and individualism. So was this the last big movement and after that um, it dispersed and is, is it true that that is related to the end of the Cold War? I'm, I'm not sure that you quite specifically answered that question. Um, and then to Dan's question about um, the arts not being quite so identified, what art is or what counts as art not being quite so identifiable anymore. It's related a little to the first question about abstract expressionism. Um, when, when there are no more real movements or schools of arts, it becomes harder, it seems to me, to apply a standard to you know, what's a good work of abstract expressionism. It's somewhat arbitrary, but you know, it's, it's easier. It's a, you can compare and there, there are things in here. And who's a good classical musician? I don't know, we have Mozart and Haydn, and then there's also better people, and you can see, yeah, they're not quite as good as like those guys. So um, yes, when, when you lose these kinds of movements in schools, and you do seem to lose a standard by which to judge. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so those two questions are related in a way, but they are follow-ups on those two prior questions. So to the first question about um, is, is abstract expressionism the last point at which there's a kind of identifiable movement? Um, no. I mean, there, you have pop art. You have minimalist art. You have conceptual art. You've got video art. And these things are all kind of you know, either emerging out of or, or, or well after um, abstract expressionism. Probably what is more to the point is that with abstract expressionism, you have really one of the last points at which the artist is defined in kind of 19th century romantic terms, where you're talking about personal expressivity, you're talking about individual vision. Um, a lot of the art movements that come after that really depersonalize the artist in relationship to the art. Uh, moral didn't do most of right, so you, you have things like a factory that produces art. Yeah. You, or you explicitly celebrate the, the withdrawal of the artist from the art making process. So it becomes about a self abnegation rather than a personal expressivity. Um, so I think that's probably, that's the moment at which you know, something does change. But these, these movements continue. Having a name, having a label for something obviously gives you purchase on it. It lets you kind of sort it. It lets you look for precedents and influences. It gives the, certainly the, the, the critic and the viewer um, a sense of it. But no sooner is a name established for a movement than the academic response is to show you why that name doesn't actually adequately incorporate all the things that you thought were in that movement. Um, that seems to be a fairly natural process, right? You, you create the label and you, you, um, you dismantle it. Um, and 
I think that's a worthy process. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to, to accept lots of fuzzy labels, especially when you're talking about aesthetics. I mean, it, it's curious to me that people want aesthetic labels to be as hard-edged and as firm as they expect um, categories to be in philosophy or uh, in the sciences. But it gives you something to work with, and it gives you something to deconstruct, which is in, you know, that's an intellectual important process. It's not you're not nothing; like you're not you're stabbing in the dark. Right, and they're kind of unavoidable. I mean, if, even if you go into you know an exhibition of minimalist art, firmly accepting the proposition that there's no such thing as minimalist art. Um, and this is actually the way a lot of exhibitions work these days. There'll be, you know, this is an exhibition about X, and the primary message of the exhibition is to say there is no X, um, but come in and enjoy it. Um, I, I think that's I think that's part of the process, um, and, and it may be fundamental to the way we deal with aesthetic ideas. Um, we're constantly in the process of both creating and 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 eroding them at the same time. Um. One comment and one sort of question. Um, so the comment is Ambrose Bierce many years ago where ancient Greeks painted their sculpture. Today, painters chisel their patrons. But, um, <laughs> and that was quite a while ago. But during the upheavals of World War II and the Soviet Union, a lot of European artists emigrated to the United States, taught in many universities around the United States. How big is that European influence on what we're seeing in American art over the past probably 30 years, 40 years? I, we're probably at a point where we're beginning to see that influence, which was enormous, beginning to fade. I think as, as that generation, you know, passes on. Certainly within within music. I mean, look at the orchestras that perform the soundtracks to our Hollywood films. I mean, these were orchestras made up of Jewish emigres from from the old world coming over and and performing. And those are also people who were teaching who were in the conservatories, who played a huge role in just the everyday life of the neighborhood music teacher. You know, the access the, the piano lessons, the violin lessons. Um, so I think I think that influence is is I don't I don't think we can even quantify it. Um, I think we're also though at the point that you know time passes and even the you know the children of of some of them are not as interested in, in that particular cultural inheritance and so it's it's becoming uh, you know less and less of a factor in, in the American culture. Yes, Hi, thank you for a great talk. I'm a grad student here at Harvard. Um, I was taken with your comments that the transcendentalists have a lot in common with, with the LBJ, you know, emphasis on creativity. And that had me thinking about um, had me thinking about what Tocqueville has to say about artists in America, that that uh, Americans essentially aren't capable of the same kind of great art that Europeans are. And while that's obviously been disproven, we have our Steinbecks, we have you know, Mary Cassatt, et cetera, et cetera. I wonder, I wonder whether the JFK approach that emphasizes excellence is an aberration um, and a greater trend that emphasizes kind of creativity and the democratic process and the kind of practical utility of art rather than excellence. That's interesting. I don't. An aberration. It's an aberration that recurs with some frequency. <laughs> I mean, if, if you go back and you look at the, the, some of the foundational debates about the arts in the United States, it, it seems like every generation is going to have one essentially about the American heritage versus the European tradition. Um, there's, a, there's a famous case um, in the early 19th century when uh, a sculpture named Her, uh, Horatio Greenow was commissioned to create uh, a sculpture of George Washington. And this was actually paid for with public funds, so the, the idea of the U.S. government funding the arts has been there for a long time. Um, and he creates a sculpture of Washington sitting on a throne, bare-chested, um, to the way, you know, in a thoroughly Roman posture. Um, and this sparks one of the first really dramatic debates about the arts in America. Um, there is a sense that this is ridiculous. This has nothing to do with America. 
um, you know, not just the fact that he's depicted as a Roman, but why are we paying this money to create, you know, a sculpture of man who did not himself want that kind of memorialization? On the other hand, you had people who were championing Greenow because this was the moment at which an American sculptor was putting something out there that could be on the world stage, that could be, you know, judged alongside the the works of the of European sculptors at the time. Um, I think that happens over and over again. I mean, uh, there's a kind of habitual tendency of America to sort of suddenly discover that we're capable of, of being creative. We're suddenly able to be, I mean, think of the you know, Van Cliburn winning the the uh, Tchaikovsky competition in, in Moscow. So I'm like, oh, we didn't realize that middle America could produce, you know, uh, a performer at, at that level. And suddenly people are taking piano lessons and thinking, oh, it, it, it changes their sense of whether or not Americans can properly relate to the, the arts and creativity as democratic citizens. So I'm not sure about aberration. I, 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 I think it's the sort of thing where we, we're surprised by it. Um, maybe not every day, but every decade or every couple of decades. I just I, I wonder if there's something in the language of excellence that doesn't necessarily sit well with ah, the American right. that approach question. to to living to, to life together. That um, you know, JFK. I mean, we we all know the Camelot myth. That is, you know, a, 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 an aristocratic worldview essentially. That you know, their, their myth and. and how they sought to cultivate the arts very much in the style of, you know, Louis XIV or something like that, right? Um, so that's kind of what was more of my question. Right, okay, sorry. Uh, you know, excellence goes underground to other places. It, it's curious that we are not embarrassed to talk about excellence in, say, sports or in cuisine or uh, in any number of areas, but we're, we are embarrassed to talk about it in, in the arts um, or within, you know, so-called elite or high culture. Um, but the notion of excellence, it, it seems it, it circulates and it, it'll come back up into the arts at times, like when you have somebody like Van Cliburn win and you suddenly take pride in American excellence or you have somebody like Kennedy. But the default position, I think you're right, is away from it, especially in the cultural realm. Martha. Sure. That was uh, just terrific. Thank you so much. Um, here's my question. What, and David, I think, previewed this with you earlier. Why are the arts in America, um, whether fine arts, theater, music, uh, even movies, why are they increasingly, or seeming to be increasingly under the influence of the left? Does this relate to your thesis about Johnson versus Kennedy, or is it something else altogether? So I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the question entirely, that the fine arts are under the, the influence of the left. Uh, I, I think that if you look at popular entertainment, there's a sense that the left is definitely um, succeeding much more than the right in putting its messages out through through popular entertainment. That That's certainly true. I look at what I'm struck more by is how much the left has abandoned um, kinds of culture. Um, you know, you don't you don't find reviews of Carnegie Hall concerts in the nation. Um, you know, there's I think the left has been selective about the places in which it's interested in culture, and it's really kind of left the field um, in in a lot of the places that may be of interest in this particular room. I think that's a mistake on the part of the left. As somebody. Um, maybe a bit to the left of, of, of some other folks in this room. Um, I think that's a mistake of, of folks on the left. I would like to see them interested in that. Um, I think you're right if you go to the contemporary gallery scene in New York, um, the ideas and the interest in the, the subject matter there are definitely going to be seen as, as to the left of, of where, um, where, where the right is, in, just in terms of the things that they take up. Um, I don't know whether that's simply the, you know, if that's a historical reason that, that it just has sort of descended that way in terms of you know, who went to art schools and, and who was teaching in them and who felt comfortable to be in them. Um, or if there's something basically about uh, a, a willingness towards experimentation, provocation that's more comfortable temperamentally to the left. It's probably a mix of both of those. Um, I, I'm not sure that even among the high arts it's entirely a left-wing <coughs> phenomenon, though. I, I think if you look at some of the artists who 
uh, are making seven and eight figure salaries, um, their politics might be significantly more conservative than um, artists emerging straight out of uh, art programs today. Have you seen uh, Hamilton? And I wonder if you uh, could give us an analysis or how, how it fits in with, does it fit in with what you have been say, I, saying today? I haven't. Um, and I, so I, I have not seen Hamilton. I was listening to the radio in the car and heard parts of Hamilton. And I thought it was absolutely horrible, and I said so to somebody. <laughs> but then they told me that, um, in fact, it was an NPR thing. It was a high school group performing songs from Hamilton, um, so that I hadn't actually heard of Hamilton. So I had to re right. retract, um, <laughs> my, retract my opinion of it. I, I, it's coming to Washington, I think, later in 2018. So that'll be my chance to to finally see it. All right, good. I guess so. as soon as the access. I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm just thinking, I'm trying to ask this question and that hasn't really been answered, which is, isn't this, we're taking for granted that art as citizen is the topic, it's a fait accompli, but is, this, is that really the case? And I'm, to go back to Bordeaux, I wasn't referencing Bordeaux, I was, I was actually kind of translating Bordeaux um, to an aggregate level. That if we think of the state as a person, as, a, as, a, as an entity endowed with capital, then we can see um, that the cultural capital of a nation might actually be its resource. And this was something recognized by educators, and this is John Dewey, right? So we want to make people literate. We want to make people also knowledgeable with the arts. We had the young people's concerts. We had orchestras. We had pianos in basically every house. This was also for moral purposes, but also to bind the nation. And during the Cold War, it seems like, at the very least, we had state investment. And actually, even during the Great Depression, we had um, art projects, we had artists right, who were um, significant state investment. Exactly, actually. among the left and the right. These were not um, marginal positions, but this was actually s s the state intervening and supporting not really questioning exactly what the content is and you know maybe we don't even need to have that conversation but maybe the conversation is why are we divesting as a state as a polity from arts in general and isn't that the problem the commercialization of the arts rather than viewing the arts as a public good both in terms of educating people because it doesn't matter whether it's abstract arts or whether it's um chopin I know I benefited from you know, the legacy of the young people's concerts and from a musical education. It helps me as a statistician because you, that is actually, you can take that with you everywhere and I'm sure you're aware of that in your own work. So that's my concern is that our, aban our, our abandonment, our disinvestment in the arts as a nation. I mean, I, you go to the NEA, they, they now have a warning that basically says, Oh, don't worry, we'll still be around for two years. I can tell you, they're actually scrubbing secondary reports on how the arts actually benefit at-risk youth. So, not only is climate science denied, which is crucial for national security, you know this, but I'm wondering if this is also a, a problem for a crisis in democracy when we divest from the arts. So when you first mentioned Bordeaux, I was thinking in terms of the, you know, uh, Cultural capital, the personal level, and the, and the, right. the, the his critique, the of, critique of right, and the, and the critique, particularly of elitism and, and exclusionary institutions, not in terms of the of a kind of national notion of cultural capital. On that level, I agree with you entirely. Um, I do think it's a terrible disinvestment. Um, I think that institutions built up over decades and centuries um, can become fragile and and collapse very quickly. And uh, you know, there is a there is a terrible watershed moment um, in, especially in the performing arts today, the traditional form of performing arts, where you're going to see orchestras across the country go out of business. You're going to see, you know, fewer theater companies, fewer opera companies. This is this is to me deeply disturbing. Disturbing. And it's sad to me that we use only a commercial model for assessing the value of those things. The sense that if they can't pay their way, if they can't attract an audience, therefore they're obsolete and we, sh we should 
be done with them and not recognize a greater national importance, a greater social importance of these institutions. What about philanthropy, then, which is for treating it as a public good but not from the government? <clears throat> Philanthropy is a great way of, of supporting these institutions, but philanthropy itself is changing. Um, where people want to put their money is changing. Um, philanthropy is becoming much more, uh, you know, people want to see the results. They want to see the practical impacts of their philanthropy. The arts don't give you those, those impacts. I mean, you, it's a much different thing to say that you have inoculated this many children against this particular disease than it is to say, here's the impact of the young people's concerts over a generation or, or two generational time frame. And so philanthropy as it, I mean, I, if philanthropy were, were uh, far-seeing and hadn't been quite so infected by this notion of you know wanting to see immediate and tangible you know um, measurable results and especially in health it's, yeah. focus on health and right. so it, it seems that the philanthropists uh, t to a considerable extent copy the government with its interest in health and it's it's, mm. it's focus I mean thinking of the Ga Gates Foundation as uh, the things which uh, interested Inst instead of uh, doing what a democracy doesn't do on its own which is uh, to support maybe the finer things of life they they do more of what a democracy specializes in which is uh, the lesser things but the more uh, obvious goods of life <laughs> I mean it is curious how many uh, Arts organizations have changed what they do or changed the approach they make to philanthropists precisely to go through health. So, you know, a healing garden within a hospital becomes a way of, of extending the mission. Um, that's fine. It's that uh, and that may serve a very useful, important purpose. But you see how quickly the institutions um, adapt their own mission to yeah. the place where the resources are going to be coming from. I, th I think of the ma ma Andrew Carnegie and his libraries. That's a combination of excellence and democracy. Uh, r rarely found in, and not generally practiced today, it seems. That they're not looking for this. Well, you may please know that the, the building that was the original Carnegie Library in Washington, D.C. is about to reopen as an Apple store. Yeah. <laughs> I think the concern about a, a singular philanthropist, though, is how much instability are we putting in if we're giving that much undue power to the taste of a few for to the good of the many? Let's think of Carnegie. Imagine that didn't exist as a thought experiment. Imagine if I proposed to this table without having a public library system intact. I think we're going to have books for free. We're going to have this on every street corner. Doesn't that sound like the biggest communist plot that has ever existed? So I'm I'm wondering, you know, if that's the, if, right. if, if, if that's if we want to if we want to have that kind of uncertainty in the system. And with the Barrow Gates, I mean, sure, his new curriculum will teach regression to kids, but great. Well, All right, so where's the art? Isn't there? Excuse me for answering. <laughs> <laughs> isn't there uncertainty in the in the public sphere as well? And, and that's what's uh, say endangering the. Uh, budgets for oh. the NEH and the NEA right now. Well, uh, th I think as a statistician, we always want to decrease our confidence intervals. And we, so we'd like to see the institutions that with less uncertainty, right? So um, the question is, well, yeah, of course, there's uncertainty everywhere, but mm -hmm. you know, balance of powers, all that. There's Sorry, a question not, over here. Hi, I had a question. You, you were talking about spin-offs and pop art and how, you know, obviously art is uh, a freedom and you know everyone has a judgment sort of like beauty is an eye of the beholder um, there's old school art like poetry is considered under art now what about like rap you know now it brings in another multiculture and people are using that as a political and artistry so like where does that fall that's a newer type of art which when would rap have started like in the 70s would you say you know, I'm going to plead ignorance on a lot of the subjects, of, I mean, up on the question of rap, but but continue. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, 80s, so I'm 90s. just wondering, like, poetry is considered, like, has it, is it becoming more of a die, die, you know, dying um, work of art? 
poetry. I mean, I think people would certainly argue that that poetry is, is reformulating itself in things like rap, in things like Hamilton, mm-hmm. which is written in a you know a strong verse throughout. Um, it, does that contribute though? Under like, do you feel like that's become a, an important part of art now, um, to especially our you know a younger generation and how that's like sort of falling into place? Like you said, in the '60s, concerts and museums are sort of like backing down. So this is becoming like another spinoff of a generation um, besides pop art and abstract and such. Right. I mean, I, th- I think certainly. In 15, 20 years, when you talk about poetry, it's going to, that word will mean much more things like you know, contemporary poetry, <laughs> like rap, um, than it will, uh, you know, reading Richard Wilbur. Um, that's inevitable. That That's going to be changed. I hope that there's, you know, a, as poetry expands in its realms, that it remains connected back to those things right. so that we see a continuity between um, you know, where poetry was in the 1950s and where it's going in, in in contemporary culture, the, the, there's a slightly pernicious thing to believe that you've reinvented the form, mm-hmm. and can then you know cast off any connections to to the precedents, um, which I think is worth resisting. Yeah. The uh, that's not an explanation of rap, but it would seem that rap's roots, or part of its roots, came from dub poetry, mm-hmm. which would be a political Caribbean Jamaican type of protest. So it's democratic in a way, and then. Rap took it maybe in a different form, but its roots are somewhat democratic as far as you know political speech. Right, I think if you read Whitman in a certain way, you can hear um, almost a, a foreshadowing of the, the kind of Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> of Kanye, yeah. Oh. I like it. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that rambling uh, question. Um, there was a question about the, the discomfort in a way with excellence in um, American discourse to other than excellence of the mark, say, um, in the arts, but also I think in, uh, I don't know, maybe also in math or uh, in philosophy um, versus excellence of the body, you could say, broadly speaking, in sports. Everybody acknowledges that, you know, they're like, fantastic. Athletes, but it's that's comfortable to acknowledge that there are people who are simply more brilliant than their minds or more intelligent or something because that goes to the core of um, democratic order, I suppose. So, this discomfort, A, is there a certain discomfort in a democracy, quad democracy, that will work itself out more and more the, the longer this democracy, the older this democracy is? And um, does it go hand in hand with the question of? as a discomfort and, well, what's the use of art? What's the use of, who are you to go to Mozart opera? It's not going to make anything in the world better. It's, you know, the poor can go there. It's not going to change anything. So the arts it seem to have gone more down the way of applied in terms of, you know, they need to bring about change, change in social justice. They're related to identity politics, say, to whatever, feminist politics, these kinds of things, performance arts, raising awareness of, um, is this is this generally something that's taking place? I'm just asking you. And would the root cause of that be in part that um, yeah that that the idea that that you have to grapple with certain questions on your own that are not going to feed back into making you know America more just and that that originally was the core of art maybe that that has gone out of um, out of fashion because. It's, it's, a, it's too privileged, it's too mm-hmm. I think the general tendency is, is not towards greater comfort with notions of excellence, but to greater discomfort with notions of excellence. Yes, that's um, Right, so I mean, if you look back at um, even the debates about creating the NEA, um, they create professional panels to judge whether or not um, an artist is worthy of getting the money, and there's complete comfort level with the idea that there are some people who are skilled at making those judgments and they're going to find good or better artists and and that's the natural process. Um, We're not so comfortable with that anymore. Um, 
in, in fact, you, it's curious looking, this is a side, but looking at, you know, at, at the EPA and the discomfort with having scientists who have actually received, um, you know, federal money actually being on the panels to, to make judgments about that. The tendency is always, I think, going to be towards, you know, a greater sense of suspicion and discomfort with with expert skill and, and with the perception of excellence. Um, to the second part of your question, and, and thinking back to Bourdieu, uh, you know, the the arts in an earlier model where people were comfortable talking about excellence and they were comfortable going into something thinking, I don't really know a lot about this, but other people do, and so I'm going to learn about it and, in a sense, submitting to the idea of, of becoming more skillful at reading, more skillful at listening. You know, when that was the model, the arts would form a community, and it could be a community that, that allowed people in. It could be an exclusionary community. As that breaks down, the arts have to find other social functions. Um, if the arts aren't functioning, as, as Bourdieu would say, just to sort of sort us, um, then what else are they doing? Um, I would argue they're actually giving us something of, of profound value, but let's lay aside the actual you know, individual relationship of the arts. What social function are they, they performing if they're not acting as gatekeepers or as exclusionary agents? And so, yeah, it, it, it's, I think, a natural tendency that they're going to go towards um, other social purposes. Um, Working, you know, working in the communities, activists um, questioning identity, all the all the things that you mentioned. I I, I think that that is, you know, that's inevitable. And that's the future. Um, it continues in that direction. Uh -huh. uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I was wondering what uh, what critics and curators, people who traditionally been trusted with making judgments uh, sort of on behalf of other people uh, can do about this and, and what their reaction might have done to contribute to the current situation. Uh, I talked to a British book critic who thinks that American critics are too weak and too open to uh, art that isn't of, of high quality in a way that critics in other countries might not be. At this point, it's really, it's, you know, there just aren't that many critics in the United States. Um, you know, it's, it's become... The, the ranks are fairly well depleted, but there are curators, and there are certainly people who are making, you know, making these judgments. Um, in the visual arts, you know, curators are often closely connected to the market for art, um, and so, you know, whether or not they're making um, fine distinctions of quality, they're certainly making effective distinctions um, because they they have to, you know, play their role within that market. Um, I think what they should be doing is distancing themselves from that process and, and acting more critically, um, you know, removing themselves from being sort of simply agents in the exchange of art um, and be willing to have the courage to, to champion stuff that they think is good and, and uh, leave stuff that they don't think is good to the side. Um, I, don't, I don't know about British critics versus the U.S. critics. I'm confident that the British critics feel superior to, to the U.S. critics um, <laughs> in this regard, um, and, and they may be right. Um, I think there's still a, a, a good remnant of a kind of, um, you know, mudslinging critical culture in the British papers that, that we don't really have much anymore, not because the critics have reformed themselves or become better people in any way, but because we're just not out there, um, where there's no one to have a conversation with. Um, mm. Uh, I'd be interested in your perspective that as a uh, critic of art to explain the discrepancy between mind-boggling prices that contemporary art brings <laughs> with all the hedge fund managers and so forth. And if we're talking about excellence, uh, you know, the old masters which through the centuries have, have been validated in terms of their excellence quality, but yet the prices that they command are so considerably less than uh, than, than the contemporary stuff. I don't know, is it kind of a casino type of mentality with contemporary? Or? I think that when it comes to the, the, the really huge prices for contemporary art, it's best to think of that work essentially as a kind of um, promissory note or a, a document of exchange. Um, it's not really about the quality of the work, it's about the exchange value of that work. and. The art market today, the contemporary art market, is is over the moon for the simple reason that people have a lot of money and they need to store someplace. And it's an easy way to store it. Um, 
in a way, I'm sort of glad that that money hasn't circulated into the market to the same degree for Rembrandt prints or, or something, because that will put those works out of the public domain. I mean, if there, if if it was equally as efficient to store your money um, in a Fragonard painting versus a Jeff Koons sculpture, people will store it in the Fragonard painting. I'm glad that's not the case. Um, and I think that the harm done by storing it in a Jeff Koons painting is, is limited mainly to the people involved in the transaction. Tom Palmer. Uh, so you work for an elite institution, uh, and you mentioned that um, there are many critics, but the digital tools in the world today are given uh, tools that cost nothing to everyone. So being a critic is democratized completely. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of bloggers that write good and some bad film criticism prints that I follow the sort of low arts of music and film, independent film. Likewise, those have been democratized beyond belief and you can't even keep up with it. I just wondered if you, you, you might focus on the critic part of it and mm -hmm. the fact that that's been democratized like the arts have. No, you're right. And, and the democratization of criticism goes from, you know, people who are writing for for established publications and, and making a living doing it to people who are making half their living as bloggers and doing other things down to Yelp and the kind of immediate, you know, starred sort of criticism that people do for restaurants or, or films. So it, it's, it's thoroughly democratized. Um, and I think that's mostly a good thing. Um, what I miss, and it's probably a function that I come out of, of a newspaper world, um, is a kind of an arena where a discrete number of voices are having a conversation with each other, and there's an ability to sort of respond and keep up with the discourse. And it's it's much more difficult as you get um, more towards the you know the, the blogging kind of criticism. Then it's essentially impossible when you get to the Yelp style <coughs> criticism to have a, a meaningful discourse. Um, lots of interesting things are being said, and that's great, but those things aren't necessarily being responded to or, or encountered and, and you know to follow it becomes a, a really cumbersome time consuming um, process they are but very small communities not, not broad right and you, it sounds like you've entered into those communities perhaps more than, than I have I have a few uh, you know a few voices that I follow um, but oftentimes after reading something I'll, I'll think you know why isn't anybody responding to this you know where where's the follow-up on this where is this going um, and it's sort of frustrating. I guess I could be the one that does it. Only but three people are reading it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Just that, I suppose, you haven't been at the Washington Post long enough, I guess, to be able to speak to this, but I wonder if the role of the critic at an institution like the Washington Post or at these major publications, I wonder how that has changed over the past decade. So was it once that our criticism was considered part of the fundamental role of these institutions, and now it's an increasingly odd uh, part of the digital empire that is contemporary media, or just in general, how, how does criticism fit within what newspapers and magazines do today? I've been in the Washington Post long enough to see a, almost two decades of how it's changed. Um, when I came there, the critics belonged to what was called the style section, which was originally the women's pages. Um, this was seen as what you did when you weren't involved with the real work of politics in Washington. Um, it was a it was a kind of entertainment, and it probably made you a little better as a person to to read them. Throughout the time I've been there, and even longer at other newspapers, there's always been a tension between whether or not the critic is writing about something, giving context to it, explaining history, essentially an essayist about the arts, or if they're telling you whether or not this is worth your, your money. You know, is it is it worth $10 to go see this film, or is it worth the time it takes to, to go to the National Gallery to see a show? So it's very, you know, the tension was between um, essentially explication and consumer um, guidance. Um, what's happened now is that because we know exactly how many people are reading exactly what things within the newspaper, there is a much more keen sense that not many people are reading about the arts. A shockingly <coughs> small number of people relative to what, you know, the people who are reading about other things, politics and, and celebrity culture and so on, are reading the arts. And so we've had for a number of years, probably about four or five years I'd say now, um, 
a kind of lovely obsolescence in which we can actually go about our own way um, undisturbed because we play such a minimal role um, <laughs> in, in the rest of the, the dialogue. Periodically, people will come along and say, well, we've got to do something about this problem. We've got to make our critics, you know, get them larger audiences and make them more relevant to what's going on. Um, I try my best not to be at work on those particular days, um, or at least steer, it, steer them away from that folly. Um, but there's definitely out there on the horizons a sense that if people aren't reading criticism, then I should be doing something different. I should be doing a different kind of writing. And so the, the pressure is to write more about the social politics of art, write about the art market, which is always of interest. You know, the, if a painting sells for a higher price than it's ever, you know, something by that artist has ever sold before, that actually gets readership. Um, I really have resisted doing any more than that than is necessary to give people an accurate sense of the art world. Um, because it's not, it's not criticism, it's, it's something else. Um, most newspapers uh, that have kept critics would really like to see their critics go in that direction, essentially out of the business of criticism. Do you think this obsolescence then, this happy obsolescence is stable or is it just, is it a, a residue? Is it this weird transition from an older age of the media to a newer age, where in the newer age you might not have such friendly patrons who let you do what you take to be the work of criticism. It's, it's definitely not permanently stable, because the forces are to, to monetize clicks. I mean, that's how newspapers, that's how publications online are going to survive. And so you can't really have um, dead wood like me lying around for too long. You can leave it there for a while. Um, and I think that, that people who do criticism like I do it will last as long as the newspapers have editors that are personally interested in things like the arts, which actually is not so different than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. I mean, the reason that classical music critics existed was because, you know, the publisher liked to go to the symphony and therefore liked to read about it. Um, that's an inefficiency in the modern newspaper model that will probably be worked out eventually. Was it just a matter of taste or was it about going back to either whether it's philanthropy or, or the nation's federal funding? It's about the public good. It's about, you know, going back to Durkheim, education is moral, or, or doing, right? It's not just right. being a technician. And that's, we can look inward at the institutions and this, this false division between humanities and science. So I, I would like to think it was about the public good. And as a parallel example, if you think about um, investigative reporting in newspapers. This is this is another place where they're not getting much return on their investment from this. It, it will earn them awards eventually if it's a good report, but you're paying a lot of people to spend a lot of time to dig up information on something that may turn into one story in six months or a year. So there's a public good model for how newspapers are functioning. Yes, we're going to invest in that, not because it helps the bottom line in any direct way or immediate way, but because we've, we feel it's important to do that kind of work. And I think there are publishers and editors who feel that same way about, um, about arts criticism. Um, luckily, the thing about the public good and our own personal interests is that we often conflate the two. Um, so their love of classical music and their sense that this is a public good can work to, to my advantage or the advantage of somebody who's writing about classical music. Um, your, uh, last question. Uh, do you have a quick judgment on the art museums of Harvard and Yale? I, was, I, re I read a recent trip to Yale and was quite impressed. I, you know, I really loved the, the museums at Yale. That, that's where I you know, started discovering museums. Um, I've always found the, Har the Harvard Art Museum sort of diffuse, like... Uh, you know, Yale's a fairly traditional art museum. You know, you go in, they've divided British art into one side of the road, and they have all the rest. It's a, it's been a fairly conventional display of the art, which I think for undergraduates is a, a useful thing, like having categories, having, you know, being able to, to identify movements. Uh, at Harvard, I think they've done a beautiful job architecturally with conjoining these, these various museums but it always feels just a little scattered um, here. Nonetheless, you have some great great paintings. In fact, I think there have been a number, I've noticed a number of shows in the National Gallery that have had um, works from the fog that have come down. So certainly the collection is 
not to be deprecated. Well, thank you for this wonderful and very thoughtful talk.